So, uh, welcome to this talk that we discuss what happened in protein structure prediction the last 10, even 15 years. Uh, and it has resulted in, uh, I would say, revolutionary change. So now, today, we can actually predict the structure of most proteins, at least the well-folded ones, to an accuracy that is close to what you can do experimentally. But we have to start taking a few steps back and thinking about how data has changed the protein field completely. So if you start with two types of data, we have sequencing data and structural data. So protein sequence data comes mainly from genomes data that you have DNA sequencing that they can turn into protein sequences. And then we have uh, uh, protein structure data. For a while, they were both increasing sort of exponentially, but for the last 15 years or so, it has basically been a linear increase in number of protein structures, but there's been an exponential increase in the number of protein sequences. So today, there are um, uh, tens or even hundreds of millions of protein sequences, and there's a few hundred thousand protein structures known. A little bit depends on how you reduce for, home or for very, very similar sequences and structures. And so basically, the increase is much faster and exponential has been going on for a long time. So if we can use the sequence data to get structure, we would gain a lot. If you do even look at the exponential, you see there are different scales in the things. It's not even exponential accurate anymore. But then there's an interesting thing, one more thing. If you group proteins into families, like in the PFAM database, you already heard about, that is not increasing exponentially. It's basically flat, or it has a very, very slow increase. So that means that for each family, we now have many more sequences. So basically, if you look at the average size of each family, it has exploded. Today, you have many families with tens or even hundreds of sequences, and the average is very big. There always exists a number of very, very small families that have very few entries, but these are a minority of all the proteins we know. So how can we do this? Then I had to take it back to work that started in the, the mid-90s. And the idea was that if you look at pairs of positions in a multiple sequence alignment, so you can start at this position and this position, and if they co-evolve, so basically, if you have a change happening one and the other one also, you have, that will be indicated these two residues are in contact. If you have a big residue that is in contact with a small residue, and then the big residue mutates to a small one, the small one might mutate to a big one. So you have a co-evolution. It's a trend to be that. It's not very strong. So in the first years, first even 10, 15 years of this idea, it didn't really do any big progress. But this is partly at least because of one thing. So if you think about the system here, and this actually problem was solved in um, I6 models in the 90s, and then actually someone introduced in the 1990 in, in uh, Lapidus did in for protein structures, but it really didn't take hold of the field before 2008, 2009. So idea here, if you think about how protein structure looks like, it's well packed, things, amino acids are nicely fitted into each other with drug properties. But then you have a mutation. So for instance, this um, pentamere mutates an arrow, and then it doesn't fit as well anymore. So what you need to do is have a compensator mutation, so you have co-evolution. Co so that's exactly the whole idea, to define this co-evolution. But if you look at it in detail, you see that the other side of this amino acid, this point of this arrow, is not the same as you had as a point of the pentamer. So you would have some indirect things. So this position here would have changed. You would need to have another mutation. So and then if you take all together, you would have a network of mutations happening, coupling things together that are not independent from each other. So you need to separate the indirect from the direct couplings. So this is what we call indirect coupling. So uh, there are then methods based on the statistical potential that are that are did this, and it's mainly what's called the DCA, the direct coupling analysis methods that was developed by Martin White and colleagues around 2008. So you basically have you have mutual information here, but you have this 
thread copy analysis can actually separate that. Uh, so instead of having an interaction between the gray and the blue thing here, you can separate that the gray is contact with green and the green is contact with blue, so that the indirect coupling you see here is not caused by direct coupling. So there's a number of papers here, not independent work, but well, this is two first independent, third paper is built on uh, Martin White's work. So if you look at the data here, so this is a, one of many contact maps we look like. So this is the contact maps. You have the residue numbers of your protein sequence here, one to 270 on both X and Y axes. And you have a gray here, you have all the contacts exist. So symmetrical, so you have the same contacts on both sides of the diagonal. You see a lot of contacts close to the diagonal. You can see patterns here that are means that are two here, this is two sheets that interact with each other. So you can see that our contacts, most of them are close to the diagonal, but they also contacts far away. So if you use this mutual information, so not the direct copy analysis, but just the direct coevolution co co signals, you have red contacts that are wrong and blue contacts that are right. So you have in this case, 22% of the contacts are correct and 78% are wrong, but you see they're not all the ones that are found here are just some of them not near close ones are right. And then one or two, this is ones might contain all the information about the structure. But if you instead use this called P and they say, you can get many more. So in this case, uh, well, two different metrics, one called psycho, one pill and say, and both of them have like 50%, 52, 58% correct contest in this case. So you have many more information here. You can see you can find patterns along this uh, real contest, but sure, there are some wrong ones, and most of them are not so informative. So you could imagine you could use this blue context here in the, well, to build a structure, to generate a model for the protein. So you see here it's right also where the contacts are. And so that was the start of this. And you'd shown there that you can do this. The one requirement was that you actually needed a very large protein family. So it only works for you that had thousands of sequences, it didn't work for small ones. And there was also kind of noisy, and it was like, it, was, it didn't work always, but it, it sort of works. It's really revolutionized the field. Suddenly you could actually do reliable structural predictions of proteins. However, there's one thing that's obvious here, if you look at it, these contacts are not randomly distributed in a, in, in a in, in the map, they are really basically they get it together. You have these diagonal patterns. When it was always exactly diagonals, but you have things that are close together. So there's some kind of patterns there. And this is of course something about machine learning is perfect. Machine learning is made for recognizing patterns. So you can basically train a machine learning model to do that. So we did one of the first models that we did here was actually caused on uh, uh, what's called PCOS C2, and, and it was basically we did actually eight different contact predictions. We had four different alignments we provided and two different methods. And we put value some extra information about secondary structures. And then we had a very, very simple method that we basically looked at the small, small windows here in this contact map. So we took a window here, 11 by 11, and asked is, and we put in the predicted contacts and all this extra information and asked, is this contact in the middle of this window a true contact or a false contact? And we had used a random forest in this one, so it's quite a simple machine learning method. And then we iterated this through these methods. We did it one time and then another time. And you could see that by this iteration, it actually could improve the predictions. I think we have an example here. Well, this is actually a very high resolution, but you can see that uh, well, it, it improved during the given thing. So you, you can get context here. Look nice. So this is an example for a blind prediction we had in test. Uh, where the, we predicted the structure of this model here almost perfectly. It was two angstrom off. You see that some loops are not perfect, but the whole thing here, and there's no homology, and there was a better prediction than anyone else did in this case. It was a small protein in the domain that we could manage to do that for. That worked quite well. But and other people showed other examples that were better than us. We were not the best one there, but there were, there were cases where we could do this. Uh, and then it was a Revolution when people just start using deep learning, as you heard about in the lecture yesterday, uh, and applying here. And I think the key paper is this by Jim Bouchou. It's an accurate novel prediction of the quantum map by other deep learning models. So the idea is very similar to what we did, but they do did a much deeper machine learning models. So the idea is to take your sequence, profile, and predictive structures. And you have some convolutional networks here that you did in the networks. You had an uh, you converted this to something which was L by N. So L is the length of sequence and N is some depth here. So you have a number of numbers here. 
And then you also had this co-evolution information, basically this PLMDCA, your side calls of that, and the uh, information, which is a L by L times uh, three or something like that, because, um, uh, and then you can add that together with uh, the information of uh, uh, the, the, this one here, which you may yeah, get the cross product on, and you get them also a matrix here. So you basically have here a two dimensional matrix, well, two dimensional matrix with a lot of uh, a vector for each position, which is three plus three times n long. And here, then you do a residual network, a two D conventional network, and with that, and at the end, you, you print the quantum map. So they show that this uh, the idea here is basically from confidence from machine learning is that you have an uh, activation layer, convolution layer, activation and convolution layer, and you also overlap loop here that's used for image processing in several other applications before. And they could see, see this is a performance. You can see uh, how the accuracy is for uh, different methods. You have the blue one is basically PLM DCA, so DCA method. Meta Psychov is a uh, other machine learning method, and green is the, this uh, Raptor X method. And you see it was better independent how many sequences you have, particularly if you have very, very few sequences, this method is better. If you have many sequences, so this is the size of the multiple sequence alignment, it's not so much better. And there were different test sets, and you see the same trend all over. So it's clearly, particularly when you have few sequences, it gets much better. And you can also look at the, mod the models you generate down, and you say basically every single case, it made better models. I mean, a few exceptions, but in general, you made better models. And you have Camillo test sets, and you have different test sets, and it was in general the same thing. And particularly if you look at top models, it's clear there was improvement in just using these contact predictions directly. Uh, and you could also see that you ha actually had very accurate predictions. But you can also see something that it's not really just doing better prediction, but it does in large way, it extends to, so you have, instead of having only one, a few contacts in between these helices up here, you have the whole helix there. So it extends and get more accurate skills of the whole exactly elements interact. And this is just some examples of models. You might have models, you see they look quite nice. The of the loops are not perfect, and sometimes you have helix that doesn't fit, but in general, in most cases, they look quite nice. Some other examples are much harder, and this, I guess, the left example is great. Other mod models get it right, wrong. And here was another example. It's still, it's not, it's not perfect, but it's, it's there. It's like most of the secondary structures there, and the man's in the right place, more. it's even bigger proton like that. So this what happened. So this was then for CAS 13, where actually DeepMind, so the Google company DeepMind, uh, was introducing AlphaFold 1. That based on the same ideas, the main difference was that they didn't predict content and more they predicted distances between the rest of views. And they did it in a very good way and they did it better than everybody else. They clearly improved things. So it was a big jump in performance between CASP 12 and CASP 13. So this is a plot for you plot ETTS, which is accuracy. So we see it from Google Random to 100 perfect. And we have sorted all the targets that were in CASP in some rank from easy to difficult. So you see that from CASP 1, 2, and 3, it happens that but from CASP basically 4 and onwards, the improvements until 12 was quite small. It was made some improvements, but not gigantic. In CASP 13, it jumped the performance. And it was not only DeepMind, but DeepMind did the best predictions, but also there was other groups there after, after the similar things. And soon after CASP 13, there was a program called TR Rosetta, which basically does the same thing that worked. Um, very similar. So they basically used the idea here. It's very similar to Ultra, to Raptor X, the Ultra Deep Learning method. You start with multiple sequence alignment. You use all these parameters to calculate sequences, all these DCA scores and PDM scores. You have a very, very deep network, much deeper than, Ultra, than Raptor X had. And you predicted distances or distance distribution probabilities for distances. They also predict angles between rest and so on. That's less important, but you can do that. And you get these nice content maps where red these things are very close to content, but you also get information on things that are not so close, so you can get much more accurate information out of them. And then you put into some program, in their case it was Rosetta, but you could use CNS or other programs also, and you make a final model. And that model is much better than you had before. So that was the state of the art in 2020. And then AlphaFold 2 was introduced. AlphaFold 2, you can see here, here is the GDT score. So AlphaFold 1 in 2018, in CASP 13, had about average score of 60 GDTS. 
in the Alpha Fold 2, it was close to 90. And basically 90s were end up being almost as good as experimental quality because there's always some variation between two crystal forms, etc. like that. So of course, even if you take away Alpha Fold 2, even without that, of course, it was an improvement, but then these matters were basically as good as Alpha Fold 1 was slightly better. But it was really, really a big jump in performance. And uh, how did was that achieved? That? So to do that, we need to understand what Alpha Fold 2 is. First, you can, you can look at another error. You can look at RMSD, so error in Ongström away. And you take Alpha Fold 2 here, it has one Ongström, less than one Ongström error. All the others are close to three Ongströms. So it really gets all the details right. It really can get things like side chains there. So this is an example of blue and green here. The side chain, you see the side chains are there perfectly. You can even put in the binding ion here in the middle, the zinc ion here. It's a space for it. Zinc ion is not part of the prediction, but it's a space for it. And it can even predict big proteins that you couldn't do before. So it's really it's a big jump in performance. So how was this obtained? So to do that, we need to few, understand a few things. So one thing is that actually it did not use this PLMDCA or DCA or this particular method. Instead, it used the multiple signals on alignment directly. So it let the machine learning method extract information from the multiple, multiple signals alignment. Uh, it also can use templates and things like that, but that's less important. But basically, it has that, and then it has a representation of this. This is basically a vector or a matrix, number of lines, and number of colors, whole other. And Use something called Eva Former, which is a, I will discuss in the next slide, and then uh, has even a structure module. But the key thing is here is really this Eva Former, and then it was a recycler. So basically, you can recycle back. So you can learn more and more and more times you recycle back. Here. It's a bit similar to what you did the PQC too, but it's really it's much more advanced. It really has can machine can learn what residues are important, what are contradicting each other, which one shall trust, which sequences in the MSA are important, which positions in the MSA are important, and so on. And it has two representations. It represents things both as this MSA and as pairs, and they sort of interact in both ways together. And then it also has the structure models that actually does not use or set or anything else like that to predict the model. It actually predicts the structure at the end. But that is, I mean, it helps, but it's not the key solution. Uh, so this EVA format, basically what it does is uses something in the machine learning which is called attention. So you have a transformer, so basically it tells the machine to focus on what parts are important, what parts to ignore. Because of course, most of these positions in the MSA are not important, it doesn't have anything to do with each other. Some secrets are more important, some secrets are very similar to each other, so they ignore. Some positions are very far away from each other, so you shouldn't ignore this information. So it puts attention on the pairs that are important. So do it both in the rows, which is the sequences, and the uh, uh, column wise that are basically attention on the uh, positions and has transitions and we modify this. It does output product mean, which basically take the sequence and multiply, multiply it to the other. So basically you get a two dimensional representation, which is the pair representation. And then has using things like this called this triangle update. So basically, if I and J are in contact and, uh, and J and K are in, in contact, then there will be some constraints on I and K. They can't be far, too far away from each other, and et cetera. And if they're not in contact, then of course the other one cannot be in contact either because you basically can learn that from that. Mm -hmm. uh, so it has this and it has tension displayed also and then it iterates through there and you get a new representation of both of the MSA and the uh, uh, pairwise and then you can recycle this. Uh, and then you have also the structure model at the end. We basically take this representation here, you take one single sequence of the one speaker here, and you basically represent in the beginning each side chain as a triangle. So you don't have even the connection between the amino acids. They are just in, in the gas phase, so they don't even connect to each other. But you have a triangle, basically defining the backbone and the orientation of the alphas. And then, you, then basically the side chain is built on top of that. And you can basically feed that information back also. And of course, it takes a few iterations to, to make a good model. But at the end, the model is perfect. It, it, it doesn't have to know that atoms should not overlap because it learns it from the structures, etc. So how good is it? So actually, one good thing about AlphaFold is that it's very good at knowing how good it is. So if you have this LDT measure, which is also not a measure between 0 and 100, it's not the same as LDTS, but it's similar. It's, you can basically predict for each residue how good you are. So basically the same thing. If you are 80, 90, you're close to experimental accuracy. So you see that it's, uh, 
predicted this is the predicted score versus the real one. So it's actually pretty good at predicting it, it's particularly up here. It basically, knows if you're good. So you can see on the model here that you can see that the blue parts here are very highly predicted, and the yellow parts are not. It's not right. So you know that this n terminal tail here, it has no idea where to put it, and it's completely wrong. But that's it's probably fixable. So that's okay. And uh, then you can so you can basically, so basically if you have something over ninety, your close experimental accuracy. Between 70 and 90, it's a very, very good model. And over 50 is probably some model you can use. If it's less 50, that's actually a good indication that this protein is not ordered, that it's a disordered region. So you see that about half the residues you can, or more than half the residues you can model with the accuracy that is close to the residues. Um, yes. And how do you run it today? So actually, the best way to run it is something you would do in the lab. You would run it, what we call it's called collab form. Is basically uh, using your Jupyter notebook and you run it there. And uh, it will take 15 minutes to make models, something depends on how long it is. If you want to make modern, modern models, but you can basically run it there and on your own thing. There are other ways to run it. Also, the code has become available, so you can basically run it installed on your own computer. There is another co uh, collab uh, repository from uh, uh, DeepMind that all you can also use. And also, there is a big database of all the structures in um, at EBI. So Uniprot has basically uh, all the human proteins and another 20 genomes. All the Swiss prot prot proteins are available. And they will provide basically everything of Uniprot 90 during this year. So they're basically all the models are available. So what else has, has Alphafold 2 been used for? It has been used. But what, what can we do? And what, 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 what can we do here? Like, uh, one thing that is actually, uh, I mean, one thing, of course, obviously, now we have accurate models of protein structures all over. So that means that we actually know things that how it looks like in many, many cases. That means we can start building networks of here whole pathways in, in cells. And maybe we can even learn something about the physics of the proteins, but that's not directly out of fault because it doesn't use any physics really. But what we know, that we realize that there is a large part of these proteins that are very flexible. So they cannot occur the structure. And the flexibility is something that happens on different time scales. And what we have worked on in our lab is basically to find new ways of representing interactions. So can we find something interactive? Can we go, do this for making interactions? And for do that, these high, high accuracy models are very, very important. There are some limitations that you should know about AlphaFold. Uh, there are, uh, it cannot predict if a particular chain is false or not. So basically, if you make a mutation that makes the chain not false, it will ignore it. But of course, you could use some other program to do that later or that. If there's a protein that have uh, multiple states, for instance, there are proteins that are bound and unbound states and open and closed states, it's quite hard to predict both of them. You get one of them. Sometimes we do something, change it to the parameters, to the MSAs, to the input, something, you get the other one. But it's nothing reliable, you can say, that I want to get all states. Sometimes it works, sometimes not. It doesn't work pretty flexible, repeated proteins. Like this, for instance, you can see here, this protein here in the top here is nebuline, which looks very nice here. It's actually a big protein, but it actually is most likely completely wrong. Most likely the helices are correct, but you see they are very unreliably predicted because they're yellow, but some part of blue. But it's probably a very, very extended model because it's actually interacting with another protein. So that, that's, it cannot really, but it's flexible, so it can't predict that. So it doesn't know things like uh, what a membrane is. So like it doesn't really know what the membrane region is here. So this membrane region here, that is in this blue protein down here, should not be positioned there because then the rest of the protein will also be within the membrane. They will probably be staying right out. So it doesn't know anything about the membrane. But membrane proteins in general can be predicted very well, but not single spanning ones because it doesn't know anything about the physics of a membrane. And the same thing if something that binds to a big DNA molecule, it doesn't know anything about that either. So that can be, uh, so it can try to fill out the position of the DNA there. Some, it can, some would like it sometimes finds nice models for, but sometimes not. So it's a bit unreliable. So it, so far it's been used to actually for many, many things. 
probably the most important version in terms of Mignon is to solve other structures, use as an input for your low resolution cryo-EM models or from other data points where it has an input, and that's probably, it helps a lot. Uh, it's actually very good for predicting disorders. Basically, if you have an unreliable prediction, like in all the red things, so yellow things here, you know that it's quite likely to be disordered. So in this protein here, you have some parts that are ordered, but they are the rest disordered. It was his of course increased extractor coverage. We know more, more, more many proteins we know the structure of doing known before. Uh, we know we can say something about the entire structure space of everything together that exists. We can use it for predicting uh, variants. So you use the model and then use other programs for predicting variants, effective models. And we can also probably use it for drug design because you basically models are so good. So in some times of this, you can dock in small molecules into them. But we can also use it for the and protein protein interactions. We can actually modify the program slightly and predict interactions of proteins. And we show a couple of examples here that we can do it. And it's actually quite straightforward. It's just basically providing both multiple alignments and you do it. And I was a bit surprised because it's not, it's not trained to do that, but it works very well in many cases. So the idea is basically you should have, you should predict some contacts if you have one chain and another chain, and you should predict the contacts between them. And it actually worked even with early methods like TR or SESTA, but not always, or in some cases it worked, but not in all the cases. But if you use, uh, yeah, so this is what we had done before, we had just TR and SESTA do that, and we use some scoring functions to evaluate if it works well. But when we start using this, so it worked, yeah, you see this is a nice example, it worked, but another nice example, but if it works out before we do the same thing, we combine the MSAs in different ways. You can basically put them next to each other or try to match them together and then put it into other fold and the results are much, much better. So basically we were down here, having 10% or 20% of what could maybe correct, alpha fold we get 50, 60% correct models. And we can get, if you just get better models, we can get even up to 72% nowadays, the best models. Uh, there are some, well, I guess it is. Uh, we are also pretty good at saying when it's correct. So we basically can say that uh, we have a score called PDOQ, the pretty the, pretty the quality of the, of the docking. And we are pretty good at saying when it's good or not. And you can see we can separate interactive and non-interactive proteins with like an area on the curve of 95%, basically, up here. And uh, yeah, this is some examples that looks good. It doesn't work always. So here, example, in our name, DNA molecule in the middle, we do get the ball model. In this case, we guys get it wrong. But in other, even for quite big complexes, we can predict them, predict them quite accurately. We do slightly better if you have bacterial proteins than if you have eukaryotic ones, but it works in many cases for both. And that's it. So let's discuss more tomorrow. <laughs>